Uh, I am Senior Interventional Cardiologist in Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. And the topic for today is a very important topic uh, which is uh, heart failure and we will discuss about the beta blockers in heart failure. I hope I am clearly audible to everybody and uh, it will be a nice session and I think uh, that uh, it will be also a Facebook live and also YouTube live later on. So beta blockers are very important in the treatment of heart failure and uh, somehow uh, if we have been missing the planning of the treatment and a lot of physicians are already using it but we want the other physicians to also use it. So in this context I will start my presentation. Lupin people for giving me the opportunity to share my uh, share my views on the beta blockers and heart failure, which is a very important topic for today. So, what is the heart failure and what is the definition and global incidence? A lot of people actually, a lot of people are watching on Facebook Live, and since we know that there are people who are non-medical, so I'll make the presentation as simple as possible, and I want to tell that what is actually heart failure. So heart or cardiac failure is a pathophysiological state in which the heart is unable to pump blood at a rate to commensurate with the requirements of the metabolizing tissue or, or can do so only from elevated filling pressure. That means actually heart failure, a lot of people, they get confused with the cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is a condition when the patient heart stops beating. While heart failure is not heart fail. Heart failure means the patient heart is weak enough it is not that strong enough to pump the blood which is required for the body. That means I repeat this definition. Heart failure is a pathophysiological state. That means it is an abnormal state of the heart in which the heart muscle is not able to pump the blood at the capacity to commensurate. That means the capacity with the requirement of the metabolizing tissues. That means the body requirement is higher and the body pumping is less. Or if it is doing at the elevated filling pressure, that the pressures can lead to dyspnea on exertion and sometimes dyspnea on rest. This is what is heart failure. It is not cardiac arrest. Heart is pumping. Heart is working. But it is not pumping to that. This is a weak heart. We can call it is a weakened heart. Normally, this is systolic heart failure. So, heart pandemic affecting 1 and 2 percent of the adult population. 1 percent is a very high incidence and over 10 percent of population. That means heart failure is very very common. I would say it's not so uncommon. The prevalence is over 5.8 million. That means 5.8 million is 50 uh, almost like 58 lakhs in the USA alone over 23 million, which is 2.3 crores worldwide. 2.3 crore of the world population is suffering from heart failure. There are various stages. Stage 1 is when the patient is at risk for heart failure, but there is no structural heart disease. The stage B is comprising those patients who are asymptomatic. The stage C is consists of those patients with structural heart disease with current or prior heart failure symptoms. This stage accounts for the majority of heart failure. The majority of the heart failure basically are consisting of those patients which have heart disease and with current or prior heart failure symptoms. This is which uncommon heart failure, advanced structural treatment accounts for 5% of heart failure population. Advanced heart failure, and we are talking most of the patients are basically in stage. Pandemic of Polio is 5.1, incidence is 6.1. What long we live beyond five years? It is as bad as cancer, actually. If you see the cancer survival, we are always talking of five year mortality and five year survival. And failure mortality is common, costly. Weak to pump of heart failure, not cardiac arrest, I again keep on repeating, it's not arrested heart. 
So they have 50% people, they will die within five years despite the treatment. But there are a lot of treatment which can further increase the chance of survival. So prevention, diagnosis and risk stratification, monitoring and managing heart failure is challenging. There has been great interest in the clinical role of biomarkers in heart failure. Heart failure in India. In India, heart failure is a major health problem. Post to 30 percent. Overall, hospitalized various hospitals in India, the mortality is 20 to 30 percent. And uh, the, during the corona time, we see a lot of patients have myocarditis and they have a low ejection fraction. So even during COVID times, if the patient is having a weak heart, I call it a weak heart, the patient chances of COVID dying of COVID is also high. Medication adherence ranges from 25 to 50 percent. This is very sad. That means despite the patient being told that his heart is not working that well, the patient do not adhere to medications not more than 25 to 50 percent. And the tolerance of guidelines based medication is low for Indian patients. There are a lot of which are, can increase. But the tolerance of guidelines based medication prevalence of heart failure as I told you, 8 to 10 million individuals 0.1 to 0.16 million individuals per year. The prevalence is 1% which is 8 to 10 million. We talk of lakhs. It's better to talk in lakhs. So 10 million is 100 lakhs which is 1 crore. So one crore individuals are suffering from this disease. Coming on to the next slide, the definitions of there are two types of heart failure. One is heart failure with echocardiography, and we always do echocardiography to actually confirm the diagnosis of heart failure. But heart failure can also be with a preserved ejection fraction. That means the patient has a 40 to 50. Normal ejection fraction is about 60 percent. That means the patients who have got a preserved ejection fraction and they still have the heart failure because their filling pressures are high. As I told you, that means the filling pressure inside the heart is left. And they can actually lead to congestion. And the patient, they are the patient. And this can happen also because of stiff heart. With the with the low ejection, patient who has got a reduced ejection fraction less than percent. Normal ejection fraction, as I told you, is about sixty percent. So we are mostly treating this set of patients, but of course this set of patients is also coming to soon, and therefore we have to be very careful in diagnosis heart failure. But what are the medications for the heart failure for the reduced ejection fraction? We are talking about that today. The distribution of LVEF in heart failure, as you can see, the most of the patients, they have got the distribution of heart failure is like this. It is the curve like this. Patients of heart failure can also have atrial fibrillation. What is atrial fibrillation? Because we are talking to physicians, we are also talking to people who are non-medical. So atrial fibrillation is a condition where the patient heart starts fibrillating, especially the auricles which is atria which is the upper part of the heart heart has got four chambers out of four chambers two chambers are the atria left atria and the right atria while two chambers are left the lower one left ventricle and the right ventricle so if the fibrillation is happening at the atrial level it's known as atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation they have already got the patients who are <coughs> basically have a low ejection fraction if they start having atrial fibrillation the pumping functions further reduce down because the atrial fibrillating at the rate of 100, 150 to 200 or 300, while ventricle is fibrillating uh, is contracting at the rate of 50, 60, when it is a controlled heart rate. But if it is not a controlled heart rate, then ventricle starts contracting at the rate of something like 120, 130. And the filling is reduced. And this filling reduced reduction is actually a big bad thing for already a failed heart or weak heart. Therefore, the patient of atrial fibrillation, for example, the patient who is doing well, heart failure, ejection fraction 30%. If he becomes if he becomes atrial fibrillation patient, the patient will become dyspneic, he will be orthopnic, and you have to hospitalize this patient. So this is actually a bad sign, and we have to really do something to convert atrial fibrillation back to sinus rhythm.
this is a word about this. Overall mortality and survival data, I have already told you that 50% do not survive. EF with mortality, the two major modes of death in heart failure is sudden death. This is very important. How the patient dies in heart failure? The patient ejection fraction is 35%, 40%, 25%, or 20%, or 15%. They are heart failure patients. If the patient ejection fraction is less than 30%, there will be class 3 symptoms. But the cause of the death in, the, in one third patient, the first manifestation of is sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death can be a, what is sudden cardiac death? A patient whose heart is contracting at a regular speed. Suddenly it starts fibrillating, you can see my hands, and stops. This is a patient who has got a heart failure. They are more prone to go into sudden cardiac arrest. And that is why most of the patients who are ejection fraction less than 35%, we advise them to have an automatic intracardiac defibrillator device, AICD. That is like a policeman. That means we do a like a pacemaker on the just below the left clavicle and the pacemaker is watching the heart and whenever there is a patient who has got a sudden cardiac arrest, it will start fibrillating, it will start shock and if the shock will happen intracardiac, patient will not come to know. It is like a shock machine which you must have seen in the films. When the patient has cardiac arrest, we give a DC shock and the patient comes back. So this will start, it will give a shock, intracardiac shock a very small electric shock and the patient cardiac arrest will be restored and this will patient re reversal of sudden death. But the important thing is that one third of patients, the first manifestation of progressing or worsening cardiovascular death could be a sudden cardiac death. Second modality, how the patient will die with death due to worsening heart failure. That means the patient has got ejection fraction 40%, 35%, 30%, 25%, 25% of 10% and this patient will become very serious, he will require non ventilation treatment and of course this patient, the weak heart will not survive long and one day the patient will actually die. So I told you there are two ways the patient can have death. Heart failure patient, a survival is only 50% within five years. One will be the patient will have a sudden cardiac arrest and patient has sudden death, silent death, sleep death, this can happen. And the treatment for this is automatic intracardiac defibrillator. We always give, it's like a pacemaker, which is implanted. And sudden and second death can be because of worsening heart failure. So coming on to the next slide, what are the paradigm of treatment of heart failure? What are the, how do we actually treat such patients? We have already told that heart failure is basically a weak heart. So what are the different ways we treat? There are a lot of medicines. We have been working almost now since I have almost 30 years of practice. I have been doing practice for the last 30 years. So we have seen a lot of changes in the paradigm of treatment of heart failure. And a lot of medicines are being used overall the worldwide to prevent or to treat heart failure. One is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, which are ramipril and medicines. Then we have angiotensin receptor blockers. Then we Diuretics and dilators, alkalosterone antagonists, anotropic therapy, heart pump medications. So these are variety of medications, although today I'm talking about beta blockers, but there are five, six different variety of medicines which are used. And as I can tell you, the fourth is CHF with systolic dysfunction. That means we are talking of reduced ejection. The patient with systolic dysfunction, that I told you, ACE inhibitors and ARB, which is amipril or almost. Then we have beta blockers, which I'll tell you slowly later. later. Then we have aldosterone antagonists, which are vasodilators. Then we have nitrates, which are also dilators. Then we have aspirins, because that will help in prevention of cardiac ischemia, acute heart attack. Then we have didoxin. Didoxin, I would like to put a small word about didoxin. Didoxin, which is known as horsepower. Actually, when you see the tablet of didoxin, which is coming with the only one company is making it, there's actually a horse which increases the contractility of the of the contractility of the heart. So when you are increasing the contractility of the heart, this is the, should be the best medicine. But this was being used for a long time, as I told you, digoxin, 
it was being used for a long time, but nowadays the use has become limited because now we have good medicines. This is also good medicine, but we have safer medicines like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, aldosterone antagonist. Why the dioxin is not safe? I want to tell you, the dioxin is still being used in a lot of patients who have mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation because this has got a positive inotropic effect and negative chronotropic effect. Those who have read pharmacology will understand. Inotropic effect means it will increase the contractility immediately. That means a very fast acting. And also it will reduce the heart rate. So that is why in atrial fibrillation patients, even those without heart failure, they're still being used by a lot of physicians. But why it is dangerous drug? Because this requires a very good monitoring with potassium levels. So if the patient has this electrolytemia, because we are also giving diuretics, because diuretic is a very important uh, medicine for treatment of heart failure, because this will reduce the filling pressures and this will reduce the reduction in the in the in the pump in the it will reduce the congestion in the lungs and patient will become better because the patient is actually dyspneic because the lungs are congested because the fluid goes from the heart into the lungs. I'm trying to talk to you in a layman language because why the patient of heart failure has got dyspnea or breathlessness, he's panting most time, he's not able to lie down because the filling pressures are increased. And this filling pressure translates into the lungs because lungs are connected to the pulmonary veins. LA pressure will go up, left atrial pressure, it will transmit into the pulmonary veins, into the, into the lungs. And the pressures inside the lungs will go up and the, actually the oxygen capacity of the lungs will go down and the patient will dyspneic. So these diuretics are very important, but this diuretic will cause low potassium. And if you have a low potassium, you are using desoxin. The, deox the patient will have ventricular arrhythmias. So we, when you are using deoxin, you have to be very, very careful. That is why most of the time we are not using it. We are dependent upon beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers and diuretics. These are three main medicines which are being used and also aldosterone antagonist and also sometimes heart pump, which is very rarely used. So coming on to the next slide. So this is what how it, So loop diuretics, this is percentage of heart failure patients and use of medicine heart failure. So if you see overall, the most important, most of the patients, 80% patients will use loop diuretics. If you see the beta blockers, only 42%. This can be increased actually. So in India, the, the overall usage, a worldwide usage of beta blockers is still limited. Desoxin is still being used 45% overall, which is not good. I would say this can be further reduced. So we want to increase this and reduce this desoxin. So overall patients requirement, antiplatelets are being used in 23% patients, ARB 36%, statins 38%, beta blocker 42%, ACE inhibitor this and loop diuretic. The maximum percentage of patients use, 90% patients will be using diuretics, which is a very important treatment protocol. Coming on to the main topic of today, which is beta blockers in heart failure. The role of beta blockers in heart failure. This has always been actually a discussion point if you remember the time of 1990s or 1980s or 1995, 94, 92, 93, 88, lot of people will be worried to use beta blocker. Why beta blocker cannot be used or should not be used at that time? People thought beta blocker is a, actually it reduces, it is a negative inotropic. That means if you use the beta blocker, it will reduce the pumping functions temporarily. It is actually reducing the inotropic activity and also it's a negative chronotropic, it's reduce the heart rate. But how it is useful, let me tell you. So limit the donkey speed, the saving energy. So this is a basically method, how beta blockers are useful. That means if you reduce the heart rate, the heart is pumping at the rate of 100. If you come make it down to 80 or 60 or 70, that means the requirement of the body of the heart will be reduced. And this is how the limit the donkey speed, the saving energy. This is one way how the beta blockers are useful. But there are other methods how it is useful. The beta blockers inhibition of cardiac functions. It, redu it affects the sinus node. It, it, reduces, it affects the AV node. Increase AV node refractiveness. It therefore, it slows the conduction and therefore reduces the heart rate. It also reduces heart rate at the level of SA node. You see, this is the heart. Heart is governed by SA node and the AV node. And there are ventricles, I told you, ventricle on the right, left ventricle and the right ventricle. And this is the left atrium and the right atrium. 
So this is affecting the inhibition of cardiac functions. It also lowers the dilated blood pressure by dilating the artery. It reduces the myocardial contract as I told you. This is a negative inotropic activity. Detoxin is a positive inotropic activity. It reduces the contractility. Therefore, a lot of patients, a lot of times, the doctors would feel that if in a heart failure, which is already a weak heart, if you give beta blocker, it will further reduce the contractility and it will worsen the patient. It is actually not true because it reduces the myocardial contractility and reduces the cardiac output, but at the same time, it has got so many other good points and it also is a reduces the contractility and suppresses formation of ventricular arrhythmias which is the cause of cardiac death. So this is how beta blockers work. I would like to tell you again, this is a pharmacology which I'm trying to revise. Effects, there are two receptors, B1 and B2, and two receptors. Uh, we are using mostly B2, with the beta blockers, which more of a beta 1 activity rather than beta 2 activity. So if you see the beta 1 sinus node is beta 1 and beta 2 both. Atrioventral nodes are beta 1 and beta 2 increases the conduction velocity. And now when you're blocking it, the beta 1 and beta 2 both increase the heart rate. And when you block it, the heart rate is reduced. When you increase the conduction velocity, when you reduce it, the velocity is reduced. Atria, it increases the contractility, B1 and B2, when it is, the contractility is reduced. And this is how. But through the beta 2 effect, it causes vasodilatation. So this is how it works. This is more of a pharmacology. I'm skipping part of the slide because this is not required for this point of presentation. Beta block it in congestive heart failure. I told you beta block it because whenever the this is how this is a very important diagram. You should try to understand how beta blockers are useful. The whenever there is a cardiac contractility reduced, peripheral perfusion is reduced, sympathetic activity activation will happen automatically. This is a body system response activation of sympathetic activity, and we have to beta block it will reduce this, and therefore. The cardiac remodeling will happen and this will actually help by because increased sympathetic activity will cause tachycardia. And whenever there's tachycardia, the patient oxygen demand, the hard oxygen demand will increase and this will actually re, actually be a vicious cycle which is blocked by beta blockade. So this is how the beneficial cardiovascular beneficial effect is decreased blood pressure, decreased myocardial oxygen demand. Decrease water and salt retention and decrease oxidative and inflammatory stress and eliminated the cardiovascular remodeling. This is how the beta blockets help. So decrease heart rate, decrease contracting, decrease conduction will have a beneficial effect by decreasing the blood pressure, decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand, decreasing water and salt retention, and decreasing the oxidative and inflammatory stress and eliminating cardiovascular remodeling. This is how the beta blocker, beta 1 effect will helpful. So on the contrary, as I told you, if somebody feels that when it is decreasing the conduction, contractility, the already weak heart, how beta blocker will be useful? This is how it is useful. It is other way around. It has got a cardiovascular beneficial effects by decreasing the blood pressure, decreasing the medical oxygen demand, decreasing water and salt retention, and decreasing oxidative inflammatory stress, and attenuated cardiovascular remodeling. This is how it works. So mechanism beta blocker in heart failure, up it, it, it causes up regulation in beta receptors, then improve beta adrenergic signaling. It causes bradycardia, therefore increase coronary blood flow and decrease particle oxygen demand. Because most of the time, the cause of heart failure is actually ischemic. That means the patient has a coronary artery disease with a blockage inside the coronary heart, in the coronary artery, and by causing bradycardia or reducing the heart rate, not bradycardia actually, it is optimizing the heart rate. That means we want the heart rate around 60. We don't want the heart rate of 100. So when you have a 60 heart rate, it will increase the coronary blood flow and decreasing the myocardial oxygen demand. It is protection from the catecholamine myocyte toxicity. Because as I told you in the last figure, the, this is how the sympathetic activation takes place and this will cause apoptosis, necrosis, fibrosis, and hypertrophy. And these all are dangerous. By blocking this, so this is how it is protection from the catecholamine which is released in heart failure. Overactive catecholamine activity which happens in heart failure, it is protected by, by doing the beta blockade. I hope you understand. Further, the heart which is having, as I told you, 
the sudden cardiac arrest can happen because of ventricular arrhythmias. Suppression of ventricular arrhythmias will happen because of beta blockade. Then again, anti-apoptosis beta-2 receptors which are relatively increased are coupled to inhibitory G proteins that block apoptosis and this is happening this. And inhibition of RAS, which is RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, when added to the prior ACE inhibitor, the ARP, metoprolol augments RAS inhibitors. This is a very important advantage which can happen. Renin angiotensin aldosterone synthesis. This is when added to prior ACE inhibitors and ARP, metoprolol, which is a beta blocker, will augment RAS inhibition. This is how it will happen. So, use of beta blockers in cardiovascular disease, heart failure, cardio, beta blockers have many uses, many multiple uses, post MI, arrhythmias, heart failure. So, it's a level A indication. I'll go into indication later on. But in arrhythmias, it is level B. In uh, acute, uh, unstable angina, it is level B. But I would say it's a level A, ACS, stable angina. So, we have to use a various kind of usage of, of beta blockers. Evidence-based dosage of beta blockers in heart failure reduce ejection fluxion. That means heart failure. Heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, the dosage of metoprolol is 12.5 to 25 mg only and target dose is 200. Disconnect. While at the same time, if you see, then I skip this slide. Efficacy coming on to, we have efficacy of beta blockers in heart failure according to heart failure left ventricular ejection fraction. So this was printed in ESC Congress in 2017. So I've picked some slides from that. The question is, what is the effect of beta blockers in heart failure patients across the spectrum of LV ejection fraction? So as I told you, there are two types of heart failure. Heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction less than 40%, and heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, which is more than 50%. So that there's no blind RCT significantly, specifically in this population. So these populations, the beta blocker has not been affected. ESC guidelines suggest managing election LVEF similar to more than 50%. The efficacy of beta blockers according to age, all-cause mortality, P4 interaction, as you can see, the overall hazard ratio is reduced by beta blockers and all-cause mortality is reduced by the level of 30% or 40%, various age-wise, if you see, in age-wise above 70 the maximum advantage happens at the level of age, which is about 60%, 60 age. The effect of beta blocker in sinus rhythm, all-cause mortality is reduced if the sinus rhythm is there. And we have a data, as I told you, that has shown the mortality reduction by at least 40% mortality reduced by, as compared to placebo. Changes in ejection fraction, the change in ejection function from baseline, if you see that patients who have got the sinus rhythm survival is the second measurement of LVEF. The ejection fraction is improved by giving beta blockers as per the slide. Summary, beta blockers improved ejection fraction. This is very important. So as I told you that a weak heart will become more weak by beta blocker because it has a negative chronotropic, ionotropic effect is actually not true. Beta blockers improve the ejection fraction and use cardiovascular mortality in patients with heart failure with sinus rhythm and in ejection fraction less than 40% or even 40 to 49%. This is our dictum from this. Efficacy of beta blockers in preventing death is also there. All-cause mortality, both in sinus rhythm as well as atrial fibrillation, the overall death is prevented because 34% reduction in mortality, I'll show you by future slides. So to assess according to age, all-cause mortality depending upon the age and gender, there are a few studies which have done and it is a class 1A recommendation for symptomatic heart failure due to rejection. This is a preamble. In patients with concomitant atrial fibrillation, we have shown that beta blockers do not reduce mortality or hospital admission, admissions. But with sinus rhythm, there is no doubt. There are also clinical concerns about treatment efficacy in others. Moreover, there are no theoretical concerns about altered pharmacokinetics in older people. So coming on to the path, whether all-cause mortality is weaker blockers according to age. If you see the age-wise, the higher the age, lesser age, the conclusion is our analysis confirmed that beta blocker reduce mortality and heart failure, reduce hospitalization. If we reduce the heart failure or hospitalization, that means the patient has become so sick that he requires hospitalization. In patients with reduced exception and methanol, the respective age in danger. That means irrespective of age, beta blockers should, should be given. Reinforce 
the use of beta blockers in all heart failure rigid ejection fraction in sinus rhythm and irrespective of age, whether it is 70 years or 80 years, irrespective of age and gender. Overall mortality and survival data, as I shown you, reduction in all cause mortality with different classes of drugs versus placebo. So this is a very important slide. I would like you to focus on this slide. And I would like to show you, if you see, as I told you, there are various types of medicines which are used. One is ARNI. ARNI is a new class of medicine, Cercubetril, with ARV. Beta blocker, if you see the maximum reduction, maximum reduction of the mortality is 63% happens when you combine RNA with beta blocker. If you see A centimeter with beta blocker, 56% reduction in mortality. A centimeter with ERB with beta blocker is 48%. Because there was time when we were thinking that combining A centimeter and ARB, but A centimeter with, with mineral receptor antagonist, which is alloctone, is 43%. ARB with beta blocker is 53%. And beta blockers with a centimeter is 43%. This is an important slide. That means reduction of mortality happens. So best would be when you have a combination of RNA, which is cyclobacterial, which is Vimida coming by the name, plus beta blockers, plus aldactone, aldosterone antagonist. So that is having 63% reduction in mortality. But all these things can not be given in many patients. Why? Because of the blood pressure. The patient who has got a heart failure, is actually having a lower side blood pressure. It's a clinical dilemma. A patient who has got a systolic blood pressure of about 100, systolic blood pressure of about 100, you cannot combine all these medicines because the pressure will go down further. And therefore, many times we have to we have to use only beta blockers, and many times we have to use only beta blockers plus ACE inhibition. So depending upon the patient clinical condition, we use very type of this. Of single agent drug that reduce heart failure. This is another important slide. Just focus again. Single agent drug. If you see alone, the study which has been shown by various, this was the based on results of SOLV trial, CHARM alternative, Copernicus trial, Merrick heart failure, CIVIS 2, and other emphasis heart failure trial. The beta blocker is known to reduce single agent. If you see single agent reduction in mortality, maximum mortality reduction is with beta blocker. Not with H inhibitors, but no, not in. But we are not having ARNI here. So I think that some slides which are shown that ARNI and beta blockers are ARNI reducing single agent. ARNI means cyclobacteria, which is a refined version of ARB, where you are using a different compound. They are almost matching the. So beta blocker reduced 34 or 36 percent reduction in mortality in patients of heart failure. That's why it's so important. The mortality benefit of therapies. Again, this is a similar slide. If you see, uh, Cecubetril, yeah, this is the slide which I wanted. Here, the Cecubetril is not there. If you see the slide, the drug is Cecubetril and beta blockers here. So even beta blockers is better than Cecubetril alone. So this is very important. I mean, we all are learning. Whenever we are presenting, we also learn. Diuretics, hydrolysine, mineral coltide, receptor antagonist, then ACE inhibitors, and even CRT, which is actually a pacemaker type of three-chamber Three lead pacemaker ICD. The reduction in mortality, if you see, with, even with ICD, which is the cause of sudden death, even with ICD, the reduction in mortality is maximum with a beta blocker. This is very important. That's why we have to learn why beta blocker should be important. So this is a slide, slide which I've shown that the heart failure will lead to sympathetic nervous system. Uh, this is blocked by this, and this leads to a good positive point with dilation in P fibrosis ventricular hypertrophy. This is blocked. The sympathetic nervous system activation is actually blocked by beta blocker, and that is why we are very useful. Adrenaline angiotensin aldosterone system is blocked by Valsartan X as a 82 1 receptors. So, this is another class of medicine, and this is another class of medicine. So, sympathetic. So, what happens in heart failure? Basically, pathophysiology. This leads to sympathetic nervous system activation, which is actually dangerous for the patient. This leads to natural direct peptide system activation. This is also dangerous. This is blocked by cyclobacterial and RAS, RAS in, in also is activated, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and this is blocked by ARBs or ACE inhibitors. So this is how, so beta blocker is actually, this is the most dangerous. Actually, sympathetic nervous system activation is most dangerous in causing death of a heart failure patient. And that is why the maximum mortality benefit is happening when you actually, actually blocking the sympathetic nervous system activation. I hope you are understanding why beta blocker has the maximum effect. 
coming on to the guidelines because there are a lot of guidelines european society guidelines indian guidelines so i will just touch upon the beta blockers guidelines what is stemming stemming is st elevation myocardial infarction with ejection fraction less than 40% class 1a indication that means a patient of we are talking of chronic heart failure we are not talking of acute heart failure mind you very very important patient will go into acute left ventricle failure heart attack patient going to ccu patient is actually requiring dialysis these patients are actually not to be given immediately beta blocker but if the patient is having stemi then you have class 1 indication but in acute heart failure sometimes you still have to wait for few days before you start the beta blockers so a non stemi with ejection fraction but in acute heart failure if ejection fraction is 20% i mean these are clinical various clinical paradigms then of course you have to but stemi with ejection fraction more than 40% is class 2 ab indication and if you see uh, the american college of guidelines this is esc guidelines this is acc guidelines 1a 1a 1b so this have to be used as a part of the stage b heart failure stage b heart failure ejection fraction reduced ejection fraction in all patient with recent or remote history of mi or acs or reduced ejection fraction evidence based beta blockers should be used to reduce mortality so here it is stage b heart failure the indication is 1b and is 1c beta blockers should be used in all patients with a reduced ejection fraction to prevent symptomatic heart failure even if they do not have an history of mi so these are various stage c heart failure that means patients use of one of the three beta blocker proven to reduce mortality bisoprolol carvedilol and sustained release metoprolol succinate is recommended for all patients with current or prior symptoms of heart failure unless contraindicated to reduce mortality that means if there is a heart failure history and the patient is still stable should be used in all patients unless it is not recommended the stage c heart failure recommended the use of beta blocker is it innovation as innovation arp in patient with hypertension is reasonable to control blood pressure in patient with reduced with preserved ejection fraction preserved ejection fraction if the high blood pressure is there then you have to use use the beta blockers uh indian guidelines indian heart journal uh, let me tell tell you the indian guidelines are not too much different they actually uh, the indian guidelines no no uh, all symptomatic patient with chronic heart failure are treated with ace inhibitors and beta blockers titrated to maximum dosage maximum dosage this is important instead of ace inhibitor arp may be used aha guidelines recommend that arni can even be started in initial stage of heart failure management so beta blockers should be used to maximum dosage that you for example metoprolol you start with 25 mg or 12.5 mg you go on to the heart 100 mg maximum tolerated means if the heart rate is less than 50 or 60 you don't increase the dosage further this is what you mean by maximum dosage increase maximum dosage uh, so uh, coming on to the as i told you initial treatment guidelines major guidelines recommendation esc guidelines that we have a nice guideline then acc esc 2016 Twenty seventeen guidelines is that you have to initial treatment option should be A centimeters plus B beta blocker in all patient with reduced ejection fraction. So there is no doubt that beta blocker cannot be missed out. Of course, you have to have A centimeter as well. Let me put it. The combination outcome twenty five years of progress of chronic heart failure. The combination outcome reduced ejection mortality reduction is sixty percent when you are using all three. And of course, I told you. maximum mortality benefit alone wise is beta blockers what are the trials uh, last part of my presentation will be trials we have various trials actually the cbs2 trial 1999 merit heart failure trial 1999 these are older trials that copernicus trial which was for the uh, for the carvedilol and the christmas trial and cnes trial randomized clinical trial reported mortality as a major tool confirmed head to head why we are repeating again and again that despite all the trials being shown and publicly not publicly but you know, major most of the times many many conferences all over the world the overall uses of beta blocker is still not more than 40 50% but there may be some counter indication but many times it is missed out that is why we need such such lectures or revision i'm just revising it everybody knows it this is a revision for me and revision for other people so this was beta blocker reduce all cause mortality hospital reduce in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction copernicus trial a senior trial bisoprolol was used copernicus trial they used actually merit heart failure trial this is copernicus trial this is merit heart failure they used metoprolol so this have shown to be a very useful drug for this senior trial had used 
bisoprolol and metoprolol in heart failure. Coming on to the important topic, first drug to be studied in the heart failure MDC trial, metoprolol. You see, we were using mostly etanolol and then we came metoprolol and then we have bisoprolol. Although sympathetic wise, I mean, the beta 1, F beta 1 selectivity wise, metoprolol is not that big. The bisoprolol and carvedilol are, uh, sorry, nebabolol are more uh, kind of selective. But it was the first drug to be studied in heart failure in the MDC trial in 1993, shown to reduce mortality and need for transplantation by 34% compared merit heart failure trial, as I told you, which was actually published. If I go back in this slide, merit heart failure trial, which was actually, if you see, merit heart failure uh, trial, which was published in 1993 or 96 say, or 2001, has shown that efficacy of metoprolol in moderate heart failure with NYC class 3 and 4 using a long-acting metoprolol proliferation. You have to use a long-acting metoprolol, not the BD dose like, uh, like uh, which is long-acting. The stop deadly due to significant decrease in all-cause mortality by 34% and 39% decrease in cardiovascular mortality, 49% decrease in death caused by progressive heart failure and 35% reduction in hospitalization. So I repeat, 39% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 49% reduction in death caused by progressive heart failure, and this was actually stopped prematurely because whenever you're doing a trial, you have two trials. One is with, with placebo and with beta blocker because it was showing such a significant importance and we never wanted to deprive the placebo patient of beta blocker. That is why it was stopped early. And 35% reduction in hospitalization. This was overall this. So comparing beta blocker with heart failure clinical trial, as I told you, the, the merit heart failure trial, which was actually in 2000, published in 2000, and then this was metoprolol sustained release. I'm again repeating, it was sustained release. MDC trial was metoprolol non-sustained release versus placebo. This was 12 months trial and reduction in mortality by 34%. Comet trial which used carvedilol versus metoprolol, they used 70% reduction with carvedilol, but that was very important. Then CBS1, bisoprolol versus placebo. CBS2, bisoprolol versus placebo, 20%, 34%. U.S. Carvedilol Heart Failure Program, which was Carvedilol in class, this was a different trial. This was U.S. Carvedilol and Copernicus trial, which was actually a class 4 patients. Patients who are having ejection fraction, of course, less than 35, but they are in NYHA class 4. That means they are orthopnic. You cannot give much prolol in this patient, and this was actually Carvedilol, which is beta 1 and beta 2, both blocker, and they found that 35% deficit in mortality, and then Capricorn trial, which was further there in 2001, this was 23%. And senior trial had used Nebulol, which is very highly cardioselective beta blocker. They found 45% combined death, but this was actually in patients who are more than 70 years age. So there was no trial which has shown. This trial known as senior trial. So this was overall mortality, but I'm very much impressed. I repeat, 34% reduction with carvedilol and uh, with metoprolol. And of course, there was another bisoprolol has also shown 34% reduction, 16 months, 26, 2,500 patients. So this is how the various trials have shown, but all trials have shown significant reduction in mortality. So we have to see. Uh, which is meta-analysis of treatment. This last time, I think, we are talking almost about 45 to 50 minutes now. Many of beta blocker patients with heart failure reduced action fraction network meta-analysis. 2013 meta-analysis, 23,000 patients all the drugs were included, etanolol, bisoprolol, bisindol, carvedilol, metoprolol, nebulol. All beta blockers showed significant mortality benefits compared with placebo, p-value less than 0 0.001. No obvious difference in risk of death, death due to pump failure, drug into a fraction. No obvious difference. This is important. But showed significant mortality benefit. Another review was done in 2001 with bisoprolol. Relative reduction with mortality was up to 35%. Percentage of this was due to merit heart failure in CBS2 trials. Improve the beta blocker, beta blocker, beta blocker select, uh, respectively. Summary of meta analysis, then there are meta analysis, older meta analysis, I'm not going to detail, but most important here was that all the patients have shown the all cause mortality by 32%, 31%, and, uh, and the percentage death. Comparative clinical outcome of beta, beta blocker and nationwide code go over. That means if you see metoprolol, carbidolol, bisoprolol, if you see all have got a retrospective nationwide court study published recently.
Uh, coming, I am just uh, repeating the slide. Merit Heart Failure, I told you, published in 2000, Bitter Broker Comparison, Carvedilol, Copernicus Trial. So, Copernicus Trial was Carvedilol, Merit Heart Failure, basically Metoprolol, and CBS1 is Bisoprolol. So, various types of Bitter Blockers. Acting therapy, adding therapy is adding life to heart failure. And uh, again, repeating the same slide, Bitter Blockers is in with us, ICD, heart failure. That means you're doing everything. But here's the atrial fibrillation also, anticoagulation, plus CRT, 81% reduction in mortality. This is very important. And beta blockers, A cervical, ARB, ICD. ICD is, in, I told you, it's prevention of sudden cardiac death, ICD. Prevention of sudden cardiac death, 81% mortality. That means if you add AICD to a current beta blockers with ARB, which is 63%, you have 81% reduction. So overall only beta blockers 40% or 39% or 34%. Beta blocker with AC inhibitor 63% reduction. Beta blocker with AC inhibitor with ARP plus ICD 76%. But if you add beta blockers with AC inhibitor with ARP with ICD with heart failure education. Why education is important? This is what you are educating. Don't miss your tablets. Don't miss your medicines. This is education. Lifestyle modification. Reduction in obesity. Then, that means education alone is reducing the mortality by at least 7%. That is why it is, that means you have to adhere to the therapy. A lot of patients, they go away. If I see my own individual practice in Apollo Hospital, I don't think that we have patients of heart failure coming regularly every three months. Many times they are lost to the local private practitioner, there is no harm. But if they are still seeing the patients, and this education program is important, why CM is important, to educate the physicians who are sitting outside Delhi, who are not getting update every time, and sometimes in the writing the prescription, and they are surrounded by patients. If you are seeing 25 patients every one hour, if you are seeing 30 patients or 50 patients in one hour, if you are seeing like a government hospitals, they are surrounded by patients. So there is very likelihood that you can miss a beta blocker. If you are missing a beta blocker or ARB, you are not giving everything, you just forget to take the blood pressure. Not forget. Because you have so many patients to see. If you don't check the blood pressure, if you see the blood pressure is about 120, 130, 140, then you can give everything. And you have not checked the blood pressure, and you have not written the prescription very well. I am not saying that this is a, it's not negligence. Because you have to be updated. You have to be very careful in writing the prescription. That means you have to combine ARNI, you have not written ARNI here, but of course AS, AS inhibitor and ARB is now replaced by ARNI. You give ARNI, beta blockers, ICD, high failure education, and if you have AF, the anticoagulation, and if you have CRT, CRT means cardiovascular resynchronization treatment. It's a different type of treatment. It's a three-lead pacemaker, which is inserted, and that has, if the patient has left bundle branch block, actually I'm doing everything, I'm teaching everything. If you have left ventral branch block in a patient who has got a heart failure, left ventral branch block, then he's become a candidate for cardiovascular re cardiac resynchronization treatment. Cardiac resynchronization treatment, where you have to put one lead in one lead in right ventricular, one lead of course RA appendage, and third lead goes inside, it could co cause an LV pacing, and that is through a special lead which is there. So 81% reduction in mortality. That means you have to combine your prescription should have beta blocker on the top because causing maximum reduction in AC inhibitors, ARBs, heart failure education, anticoagulation. If you have atrial fibrillation, you have to anticoagulate the patient. Very, very important. We miss, now we have oral anticoagulants which do not require the measurement of INR. Don't miss anticoagulation and antifibrillation. Even if you have intermittent antifibrillation, because the patient will have stroke, he will die of stroke, he will, have, he will have major problems and you will not know the patient is, will stop coming to you because he has stroke, is paralyzed. So anticoagulation is so important. I am just giving emphasis. To conclude my talk, beta blockers are currently the cornerstone of heart failure therapy. Despite having negative control, because it reduces the sympathetic activity which happens because in all patients who have heart failure, this is going to happen as a body response. And that body response is actually harmful for the patient. Up trying to maximum dose achieve in clinical trial necessary to achieve maximum benefits. If you are using metoprolol, 25 mg may not be enough. You have to use 50 mg, 75 mg. 
You have to keep increasing till you have optimized heart rate and blood pressure is still normal. Bisoprolol, cardiolol and sustained release metoprolol sustained currently approved for beta blocker for heart failure. Carvedilol, of course, is a low dose. It is, it is, it is, does not cause too much of heart failure, heart rate reduction. So I would say I would use these three. But senior trial have shown that the Vivarol can also be used. Use of beta blockers in clinical study have shown to reduce mortality and hospital admission by approximately 34%. Alone, with combined with AC inhibitors, ARB, it is 60%, as I told you on the previous slide. So don't miss beta blockers. Beta blockers are very important. And the most important are carbidolol, bisoprolol, and, and sustained release metoprolol. I repeat, sustained release metoprolol for the overall treatment. This is the final slide. I again thank the company people, Lupin Pharmaceutical, for giving me this opportunity to talk about beta blockers and I tell you what is actually heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. With heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the beta blockers may not. This is a different therapy. Mostly directives are helpful, but those are rare people, not are so common. The most common is heart failure with reduced ejection fracture. Thank you very much for watching this video live. I was also doing live on the Facebook. I thank the Facebook viewers to understand what is heart failure. It is not cardiac arrest. Heart failure, heart failure, heart has not stopped. It is a failing heart, reduced pumping, weak heart. How can you say? So I'm thankful to everybody and uh, I hope uh, if there are some questions, I'm ready to answer. Uh, Okay, sir. So, shall we wait for a few minutes for questions? No problem. In the meantime, I will keep talking and then I, again, for the non-medical people, I would like to say, don't scare yourself. If you have a heart, a weak heart, you can still live, live long. And of course, one very important point which I want to tell you, we have to find the cause. Because once I do an echo and I find the ejection fraction is reduced to 30%, what we have to do? We have to find why it has happened. Many patients, they become dysmic many times. They come orthopedic, you know, sas fully shuru ho gai hai. Abhi thoda din tak thik thi, ab ek mahine se maata di ki sas fully shuru hai. We will do ECG, we will do echocardiography. Echo me pata laga, heart ki pumping is now 40% or 35%. Now we have to find the cause. There are two causes. One, there are two types. One is, of course, you have the cause. And most common cause is coronary artery disease. That means we have to do a patient, stabilize the patient. And we'll request the patient to do coronary angiography, even with the normal ECG. Even with the normal ECG. Of course, you may have an ECG which is abnormal, that means acute MI or low, old MI. Then, of course, you have to do angiography. But even with the normal ECG, there are two ways. A lot of patients will do a dovitamin stress echocardiography, that will stress the heart. But that will I will not like to do. I, it's better always because sometimes you can miss because dovitamin is so echocardiography, stress echocardiography. There are two ways. First of all, whether the patient is fit or not, he is still dysmic. You cannot do stress echocardiography. But best would be, and secondly, you can miss the diagnosis because the sensitivity of a stress echocardiography is about 80%. That means 20% will be missed out. That means you have to uh, do a angiography, rule out. If the coronary artery blockage, I will tell you an example just now. A few days back, I had a patient who came to me. He had a low ejection fraction of 15%, only 15%. But that was recorded about one year back or nine months back. I said, now you look okay. He said, my blood pressure is fine. And he said, he's on few medicines. I, I requested for repeat echo because it was about nine months ago. This is a very important example I'm giving you. And he had no chest pain. And there was no history of any old MI. That means ECG was normal. Ejection fraction this time in Apollo hospital was found to be 55%. He was very happy. He never was happy. That means his heart, which was very weak, has come has become normal. But despite that, I said I would still would like to do angiography, and he agreed. Normally, patients will not agree. My heart is okay. What is the need for angiography? What is the need? Because my first 15 to 20 percent was not done before. This could be my bad idea. Actually, what happens is there could be a small inflammation of the heart. Which has led to a temporary or transient reduction in ejection fraction. Temporary or transient reduction in ejection fraction. And